a petroleum operator, you know the oil and gas industry is changing fast. You've got to adapt to the future by creating greater efficiency in operations, reducing risk, and designing for a more sustainable future. You also know everything in energy happens somewhere. And since getting location right is so important, turning to ESRI gives you the power you need to stay ahead. You get the most advanced capabilities in the industry from the world leader in location technology. With our integrated GIS platform and huge partner network, you have access to groundbreaking solutions and a complete GIS enterprise system. Network management tools with True3D let you visualize your system the way it looks in the real world and bring your design to life to model and manage emerging renewables. Spatial tools give you a better understanding of your network and assets. Mobile field apps streamline data collection, routing, and navigation. When natural disasters strike, you get real-time monitoring of operations to reduce risks, speed up recovery, and get back to business faster. And you can create a true digital twin of your network to show connections that match the real world. Plus, an open architecture lets you share maps and apps on any device, any system, anywhere, anytime. And with cutting-edge spatial analytics, you can leverage IoT, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to understand the past better and forecast the future more accurately. With S Relocation Technology, you'll have everything you need to supercharge operational efficiency and diversify to meet growing demands of the future. Morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Ezra Petroleum User Group meeting. My name is Jeff Allen. I'm the Global Pipeline Practice Lead, and I'm gonna be your MC for this morning's sessions. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting presentations for you today. Uh, great uh, lineup of presentations relative to the pipeline industry. We're going to be looking at uh, talking to RPS and Matt Horn about some offshore HCA analysis. Then we're going to flip over and talk to, to Phil over at Boardwalk about their system of engagement and what they've been doing to push data out to the rest of the organization. Sean Holmes and, and Matt Gaffner have been doing some really cool stuff at One Oak with real-time data and weather safety. And then Derek and, and Danielle from, uh, from Enterprise Products talking about their mobile implementation. And then some really cool stuff uh, around imagery and uh, being able to tie in some oriented imagery from Aerial Patrol, from Edward and myself uh, to wrap up the user presentations. Uh, so I think this is gonna be a really valuable session for you this morning. Uh, please sit back and enjoy great presentations and, and hopefully we can uh, bring some to light some of the different workflows and pipeline that we've been working on. I did want you to, uh, to, to, in the interface on the right-hand side there, you will see the ability to join and ask questions through the chat window. Uh, I'll remind you of this uh, a couple of times during the presentation. We really encourage you to, to really engage with us and, and ask questions. Uh, we're going to hold off on the Q&A until after all the user presentations. So we'll go through the user presentations and we're going to bring all the presenters back in live and we'll go through a live Q&A. So as you're going through and as you're, as you're seeing the presentations, please jot down any questions in that chat window, kind of indicate which presentation it is. We have some folks in the back end that are collecting all the questions and we'll be feeding them back to me as a moderator so I can, I can ask the presenters as we go through. So please take some time to do that. It really helps us uh, with the experience and, and gives us feedback on what you guys are, are really looking for in the presentations. So to start out this morning, what I'm going to do is take a couple of minutes to really talk to you about what we're seeing as advancements in technology in the pipeline realm, right? So this is where, really where my focus is every day, uh, talking to operators, talking to customers, trying to figure out what people are doing and sort of how to pin this all together with, with the Esri technology. And, and really a lot of the work that I've been focused on is trying to figure out you know, how do we manage 
uh, data more effectively and push that data and bring value to the organization with this uh, sort of system of record information, whether that be upstream data for oil and gas, offshore, onshore gathering systems, the traditional space where we've where we've always played in the midstream, and also a bunch of interesting workflows in the in the downstream segment. But really, how do we tie this all together and represent this in a in a real world scenario? And Brian had kind of touched on this idea yesterday in the plenary about this, uh, you know, the digital twin and ArcGIS being the foundation of that digital twin. So I want to just really expand on that concept a little more. So this concept of the digital twin has, has been around for a while. Some will consider it more of a buzzword, uh, but we've really taken some time here at Esri to put some some real structure around what this means and what it means to, to build a digital twin of your pipeline assets in the ArcGIS system. And it's really kind of as a baseline or a definition, really what, what are those digital twins? They're, they're really the virtual representation of those assets in the real world. But I think what really brings it to life for me is it's not only the physical objects that are in the field, but how those physical objects relate to each other, what behaviors do they have, and how do they participate in a, in a real uh, real time process, right? Those are the intelligence. It's not just simply points and lines on a map anymore. Uh, these devices have behaviors, they have rules associated uh, within that digital twin. And really what we're doing is leveraging the GIS to really build that digital twin of that, uh, of that physical environment into the data models. And so it's not only just the pipeline itself, the digital twin, right? So we have other representations or other twins. And the idea here is that these digital twins can work together. So we have what we would consider the network information model. This is where we build the pipeline systems. We also have things like building information models, maybe where these facilities uh, are contained within. We also have kind of landscape information models or information models about the real world. These could be things like geohazards and how they may impact the pipelines. So it's not just a single digital twin, but really a collection of digital twins that are brought together within the ArcGIS system and then talk together. But what does this digital twin solve? You know, when do I go to my management and I say, hey, I, I need uh, so many dollars to build a system of record and build a digital twin on my pipelines. What are those things that we're trying to solve this digital twin? Well, first and foremost, what we've been doing for years is a historical baseline of what our assets are in the field, right? What do we own? Where is it? What's the location? What's the history of it? But on top of that, physical assets, we now also want to integrate real-time data, right? This kind of brings a digital twin alive. Now, obviously, the first thing you think about when we think about real-time data is integrating with SCADA. But there's all kinds of sensor information along the pipelines, including personnel, people, vehicles, flow information, other systems. All this data really belongs inside the digital twin and really brings it to life and makes it a real thing with real live data inside of it. But then the third thing, and I think is the most important and, and probably the thing that, that is sort of emerging in the digital twin area is to be able to take that combination of the physical assets and the real-time data, put it together, and then test the model for future outcomes, right? So first thing that comes to my mind is flow modeling, right? We've been doing that in a separate system for years, taking the GIS data and moving it out. You know, we want to be able to do that all together inside the system and, and bring that information together. So there's really four key pieces of that digital twin, right? We have the, 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 the four key components that go into it. It's the data capture and integration. It's the visualization of that real-time data. It's a sharing and collaboration and that predictive analysis. So really when we think about that, you know, integration and data capture, it's not just about data management and pipeline data models and putting information into the system. It's things like extracting data from reality capture. It's data modeling around 3D BIM information, bringing information from, from other sources or information in from real, real 3D uh, data capture. These are all kind of foundational components of building that digital twin that we're integrating through the platform. It, in it what also includes things like uh, the ArcGIS pipeline referencing system and the APR system itself. But customers are always really interested in how they bring in information from, say, construction, design, and as-building, 
right? So we've been doing a lot of work with integrating with things like AutoCAD and Autodesk to help move data efficiently between these two systems. So we've got the GIS system that's really been primarily focused on planning, regulatory compliance, and that sort of that cap portfolio capital portfolio management, right? That ongoing operations. But planning data from the GIS feeds into the detailed design, pre-construction and construction process. And then that as-built documentation wants to flow easily back into the GIS for operation. And it's this integration of these two systems, not the separation of these two systems. That's the important piece to take away from this slide. We're, we're doing more and more to make this movement of data between the CAD world and GIS world seamless as we go through that process. Then it's a real-time visualization, right? Another pillar of that digital twin. So integrating things like velocity that we saw yesterday from Matt and the, and, and the geo event server, bringing in real-time information and be able to overlay that on the physical assets really enhances that, that decision-making process relative to those assets. So we've got all kinds of different tools and technologies that allow you to do that, not only bring that data in, but report on it, whether it be through dashboards or other types of web interfaces to be able to take that information and then easily move that out to the decision makers within the organization. And then finally, that kind of really sets the stage for sharing and collaboration. And we've seen all kinds of really interesting use cases about how companies have taken this data that was locked away within their GIS department, put on alignment sheets, uh, and really enable the rest of the organization to have access to this data in real time through things like web maps and story maps and dashboards. And this is, we've really seen a proliferation of this type of technology through these organizations because we can now build these really fit for purpose applications. We no longer have just one web application with a thousand widgets in it that we display to everybody, We're really building these very fit for purpose apps that we can really target the audience uh, that uses that application and put tools in their hands that allow them to be more efficient on a daily basis. And then the last piece of this, the last pillar of this digital twin is this uh, providing insights for future data modeling, right? So we're looking at machine learning, AI modeling, uh, how do we take this information, put it through some type of predictive analysis, and then really gain some interesting insights and value to the organization? So we're doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, we have a whole team dedicated at Esri to this AI ML um, machine learning problem and a lot of interesting templates that we've actually started producing, a lot of them very specific to pipeline, like building extraction. Uh, or like real-time modeling, right? So take a look at those uh, new models. They're very, very powerful and then tie directly into the, this digital twin concept. But at the end of the day, really to, to build this digital twin, if we want to really start at the foundation, we need to have that physical record of the assets. And so customers are asking us a, a couple things in this area. First and foremost, they wanna upgrade and modernize their core system of record, right? To be able to take advantage of the AI ML, the story maps, the dashboard, the system of engagement. Really, we need to have that data inside the enterprise geodatabase and accessible to the rest of the stack. So companies are looking to consolidate their data sets, build a single enterprise geodatabase for all their pipe records. Uh, the second question we're being asked is, hey, we want to leverage more, we want to leverage our investment in Esri. We want to be able to edit that data inside that Esri Geo database with out-of-the-box tools, right? So this is where we layer on top of that enterprise geo database, RGS pipeline referencing uh, for the linear referencing, that midstream segment, but also the utility network to build a connected model. Because if we just have routes and measures, but we don't know how the system is connected, if we don't bring the intelligence of the devices to understand you know, what's an open or closed valve, or what's a pump, or what's a compressor station, what's downstream of those, we really can't do that forward predictive analysis, right? So we need the intelligence of the utility network, which builds a connected model. We need the power of linear referencing to deal with all the regulatory layers that we need to lay on top of those pipes and we need them to be working in conjunction. And that's really what we're offering to the industry, right? Is that, that package of these tools on a single enterprise geodatabase working together 
uh, to build the foundation of that digital twin and really drive all those workflows that I showed you on those previous slides. So let me just show you a quick demo of what I'm talking about relative to those tools. And I'm just gonna screen share here. Okay, so this is a typical pipeline system. Uh, I know a lot of you have probably seen this before, but I, I do have a couple of new things to show you. Everybody who sits through my demos knows that uh, I never take up on a, I'll lose an opportunity to show something new. But for the folks that haven't seen it, right, this is the idea here is that we've got a connected network of pipes, both upstream uh, gathering or onshore gathering down through a transmission system, and then ultimately into some downstream facility uh, at the refining on the other end. This happens to be a, a crude line, but the same sort of cadence would hold true for a gas uh, transmission system as well. And so when we really start thinking of what we've been doing traditionally with, with these models, uh, if I zoom in on, on a station here, you know, we've always had the ability to build routes and linear referencing in, the, in these models. And if I turn on some context here, by turning on some imagery, you can see we've got the, the sort of pipeline uh, linear reference model here coming into this station. Uh, we stop at the, at the end of the line here, and we pick up at zero plus zero and keep on going downstream. Now we don't really have a lot of intelligence of what's going in here. So when we start layering in the utility network, the first thing that I have the ability to do is start to manage both my stationed and non-stationed pipe. Right, so, so here now I have the utility network underpinning my linear referencing system and I've started to build out the launcher receiver assembly that I might have not have had previously in my linear referencing system. And then I can start layering in my pipeline devices. So in this, in this particular case, I've got sort of two mainline block valves here and a pump or compressor station sitting over here inside this building. And then layering in some, some junctions. And, and the reason I'm doing this is because in this very simple case, I wanna to start to build a connected network. So now I'm using the power of the utility network to take these objects that are in the model and connect them together. So here I've just created an association between the endpoints of this pipeline, connected through, discover this pump, back out onto the line here, and down through the system. So when I, talk, when I talk about mapping inside the fence, I don't mean having to have every little component and every little bend, but I do mean to start building some more additional uh, intelligence around these facilities using, using this concept of, of the utility network and the linear referencing system combined. So if we start thinking about a different example, you know, here's a place along the pipeline that we've, we've typically had a lot of issues with, right? So I have three pipelines running into the station. Uh, I really have some, some stationing information here, but I don't know how these lines are connected. And if I do have information about what's going on in this facility, I've typically just added it to the ends of my pipelines. Maybe I've just created an inventory stack at the same station, but I don't really know what's going on inside of here. But the first thing we would have allowed us to do with the utility network is create what we call uh, containers. So in this case, I've created a GIS object that represents this station as just a single point. And if I go into this point and I modify it and I take a look at what's going on inside of here, you can see it's got a list of features that are associated with it. And if we just turn those features on, take a look at what's going on inside this facility. You can see all those features. So these are all the features that I've got associated with that facility. You can see the pumps, uh, the T's, the fittings all inside of here. And again, we have connectivity that shows how all these things are connected together. So if we just turn on the connectivity view again here, We'll see we come off of this main line into this T, we branch out into these valves, into these meters and pumps. And now this is a fully connected discoverable network. If I was to do a network trace through this part of the, of the network, I would find all these objects and I'd see how all these pipes are connected, connected together. And then finally, if we kind of think about it in the terms of, 
of what I'm really after for a fully mapped out system, I can go to this station here where I've got both linear referencing, linear referencing pipe coming into the launcher receiver. I've got the inside the fence uh, uh, piping mapped as well, as well as the, the bits inside the building, right? All connected together, all inside the, the, the single data model and discoverable as I, as I move down the system. So this is key as well, because not only can I discover these items, but I can represent this whole thing in a different way. Uh, so I'm now going to leverage the, the ability to create a diagram from this particular system. And now I've just taken that entire pipeline system and, and represented it as a single line diagram. So here you can see that same pump station. I can see all the bits inside of it. If I zoom in a little closer here, I can see all my design pressures for all my fittings. And if I'm really interested in this, say this meter here, I can just select on that meter and apply it back to my map. And you can see everything is connected together. And there's that meter there on the map. So I can move back and forth between the diagrams and the map. I can represent this, this information in different ways. But ultimately what I'm trying to do is also be able to edit this information. So my last example is really kind of coming down here into this reroute area. Here I have a typical pipeline segment, uh, section of pipeline here. And I've got, if I wanna take a look at the, the underlying survey data, what I can do here is turn on some support layers. So I've got an as-built survey that came in for this section of pipeline. I've got a bunch of weld information along that line and, and ultimately some pipelines. So in this case, I've just used the out of the box Esri tool to sort of create that pipeline, connect all these welds together uh, for this reroute area. And then just using the out of the box Esri tools, take that reroute, take that pipe information and move it into the utility network, right? So now I have that pipe information in the utility network. I have that pipeline built and then using that same information from that pipeline, I can go ahead and start and do say a reroute in this area. I can select these center line objects. I can choose what network I'm gonna do this reroute on. Choose a date that it's active. And then ultimately tie this reroute into those, those lines on both ends. Then I would just go ahead and finish that reroute out. And that would then take that pipe and move it into the utility network and into the APR. So again, using out of the box tools to go ahead and, and create those layers, create that pipe, add it to the utility network and, and finish off that reroute just using out of the box Esri tools, a combination of, of the location referencing ribbon that house all my linear referencing features and my utility network to build that connected model of pipes and fittings underneath. So that's a quick demo of what we're doing from the from the pipeline. Obviously, those demos get pretty complicated. We can go really deep into that into that digital twin. But the idea is to bring all that information together, whether it be linear referenced or non-station pipe, connected together, and build the foundation, and then layer on top of that the real-time data, the system of engagement, sharing that data out with the rest of the organization, and then a predictive analysis. So now we're going to transition into the user presentations. So we've got about five presentations this morning from, from different, uh, different users. And first up this morning is, uh, is Matt Horn from RPS. And Matt is the director at RPS in South Kingston, Rhode Island, uh, where he manages a team of experts, uh, of both engineers and technical staff. He's a senior scientist specializing in, in unmitigated and mitigated response of oil spills. Uh, he's got 10 years experience at RPS. He's including uh, uh, 
experience with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. He's provided expert testimony evidence on, on several regulatory hearings, both here in the US and Canada. And Matt's gonna really discuss how, we, how operators have uh, really transitioned from using some of the desktop tools and, and onshore HC analysis and applied them in the offshore scenario. And I thought this was a really interesting presentation because uh, obviously we've been doing onshore HC analysis for years, looking at streams and rivers and, and topology. Uh, but what happens when we translate that into an offshore environment where we have winds and currents that are changing all the time? So this has really taken you know, this problem and, and really magnified it exponentially. And Matt's been doing some really interesting work on how to leverage the power of the GIS and analytics to really solve and answer this question about you know, what happens when there's a pipeline incident offshore. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thanks for the intro, Jeff. So I'd like to speak with you guys today about the offshore HCA analysis we're now currently doing for a number of different operators associated with pipelines in the Gulf of Mexico. What we're doing is we're using some of our in-house tools and ESRI-based visualization analysis steps to identify high consequence areas for pipelines in the offshore environment. So what I want to do today is walk you through a little bit of spill modeling 101. I'm going to show you about some of the traditional inland approaches we've done with HCAs and AOI impacts. Those are high consequence area or other areas of interest. Um, in that traditional inland approach that many of you have likely seen in this forum as well as many others. And then I want to talk to you a little bit more about some of the new approaches we've been using in the offshore environment. Specifically, I want to look at the development and application for offshore pipelines. And I want to show you then some example results and conclusions to kind of talk you through how this is a little bit better than our, our previous approach. So for those that aren't aware, uh, spill modeling has been used for planning preparedness, assessments of consequences from releases of hazardous substance. And there's essentially three questions we look at. They're trajectory, fate, and effects. If there's going to be a release, where is it going to go in the environment? How would it behave? And ultimately, what would that mean from a biological or socioeconomic perspective? Now, for an HCA assessment, really what we're looking at is the is, what, or when questions. Is a resource affected? If a resource is affected, what is that resource? And then when would it be affected? How quickly could that resource be affected? So this is a tool that many of you may be familiar with this. This is oil map land. It's our overland and downstream transport model. It's a, a two-dimensional model. That's an oil map land extension for GIS. It runs on the GIS platform and produces GIS outputs. And what we're looking at is how oil is going to move over the land surface, adhere to land cover, flow down, down slope essentially, um, filling pools and depressions, evaporating, spreading, and then ultimately leading to a waterway where it can be transported with the current of the, the waterway at the specific velocity at each downstream reach. Oil could be retained on shores, evaporate or spread radially in lakes. We use automated processes um, in GIS uh, basically to identify HCAs that could be affected using overlay analyses. And here we're showing you some traditional outputs uh, in the top left, looking at some trajectories of where releases could ultimately get onto the land surface in brown or make their way into waterways in gray. Um, what the mass balance of the oil is and what mass balance means is if you have 100 barrels that gets released, how much of that could evaporate? How much of that could stick on land? How much of that could, could be found on the, on the river surface or the lakes? Um, and then the image on the right actually takes kind of a combination of the two of those outputs and kind of mashes them together, looking at the minimum time. Essentially, if there is a release, how quickly could that oil move over the land surface and then move downstream? So here we're looking at oil, um, in this case, leaving a, a, a rail corridor where we've got some land pooling in these orange areas. If you see my mouse here in the, uh, in the middle right of the screen. Um, releases entering waterways and then flowing downstream and that line going from a red soon to a blue, i.e. it takes a lot longer for the oil to get down there. This works in the on land assessments because elevation rarely changes. We, want, we run an interval based approach where we've got a couple hundred releases that are simulated over hundreds or thousands of kilometers. And we basically get a set of outputs that kind of holds throughout the year. We use some automated tools to then process uh, other layers of interest, these HCAs, to then identify, uh, this image on the right, 
the overall number of HCAs so we could identify that maybe 80% of this pipeline has the potential to affect an HCA, or we can break them out by ecological resources, drinking water resources, other protected areas. I think you can kind of see where I'm going here. This is the traditional HCA or AOI um, for the terrestrial assessments that we've been talking about. But when we get into the Gulf of Mexico, things get quite a bit different. We've got currents to contend with. We've got tides, we've got rivers, there are winds and waves. And all of these are spatially and temporally variable. Here, what I'm doing is just looking at um, some of our IUS EDS model viewer data of the NOAA RTOFs currents and NOAA GFS winds on top of one another. And if you were an oil particle sitting on the surface of the water, you could imagine that depending on where you were in the Gulf of Mexico, you're gonna be feeling a lot of different pressures to move in different directions based on these, these, um, these driving forces of winds and currents. And a traditional HCA assessment simply cannot factor these changing dynamics in. If we were to run a release here in April and a release here in January, it's very likely that that oil could go in a different direction. And just like that oil could go in a different direction if it happened at 6 p.m. versus 6 a.m. with an ingoing or outgoing tide. So what we're doing now in the offshore environment with a couple operators is applying our SIMAP or oil map tools. SIMAP is a spill impact model application package and it's actually a, a four dimensional trajectory fate and effects model. What we're doing is we're looking at oil moving on the surface in the water column and looking at how it can evaporate, how portions can dissolve into the water column. We're looking at a number of different fates processes. I don't wanna walk you through all of these, but what we do is we discretize a release. We break it up into many thousands of different particles and then allow each one of those particles to move through the environment to figure out where oil would go. Now that would be great if we had a single release, but when we're looking at an HCA assessment, we're trying to capture an understanding of what would happen if this release happened at any point in time. So what we need to do is apply what's called a stochastic approach. And what I mean by this is a very big word for a very simple process. Um, on the left-hand side here, we have a number of different trajectories. What's a trajectory? Basically imagine that each one of these releases is that very bad day that happened. Maybe that orange one is April 3rd at 3 p.m. And we'll see where that release goes based on the winds and the currents. Maybe that magenta one is January 24th at, at 7 p.m it goes a different direction because the winds and the currents and the tides were doing a different thing on that day. And what we can do is by staggering the start dates over multiple years, five to 10 years, and running hundreds of different scenarios with randomly selected start dates, we can begin to develop a statistical approach to determine where oil has a likelihood of going. It's a statistical analysis of not only determining the probability oil will wind up in a given place, but by looking at all of these results stacked up on top of one another, we can identify the minimum amount of time that it might take for oil to get to a given region. Now, we look at individual representative trajectories and environmental assessments, maybe looking at individual 95th percentile worst cases, and we can parse things out by summer or winter, but that's not necessarily necessary in this case. What I wanna do here is basically use these trajectory results on the left stack up a couple hundred runs, and then on the right-hand side, look at where these probability footprints overlay with specifically resources of interest. Now, I just wanna think about three different hypothetical cases. Let's imagine that you have a pipeline, it just comes right offshore, and it runs out to a facility, maybe a gathering line, and that's this image on the left. If you had a pipeline that was oriented like that, you're likely gonna to wanna to run a release at the furthest offshore point. In a release, I mean 100 releases. And what that is going to do is say, look, if releases from this most offshore point can reach land or breach an HCA, then it's very, very likely that the rest of your pipeline could. And we don't need to run releases every 100 meters back to land because you already know the furthest offshore could touch a resource. So that entire pipeline would be a could effect. In another case, let's just imagine that you had a pipeline that spanned a gap and it went from land to land, but there was water in the middle. In those cases, you might wanna run a release at the furthest offshore location. In this case, it would be the center of the pipeline, right? Because if that, if that specific point could affect receptors, then it's very, very likely that the rest of the pipeline could. In another case, you might need to actually run several releases. Let's imagine if you had a pipeline um, that extended from this location and, and, ex and went up into Mississippi Sound. You know, you've got that pipeline traveling through three different hydrodynamic environments, three different 
um, potentially ecologically sensitive environments, and you might need to run several different release cases. But what we would do is then take those results and we would overlay them on the high consequence areas in the region. I realize that this is an absolutely ridiculous simplified depiction on the left to identify high consequence areas. This data is uh, typically considered confidential um, and the operators provide this to, to um, consultants like myself so that we can do these assessments. But the key here is that we're taking this footprint in the offshore environment with all of these different environmental forcings identifying the location and the type of resources that could be affected, quantifying the number of resources that are affected, and then the determining the minimum amount of time it might take for an oil spill to impact that specific resource. When we're doing these kinds of assessments, what we typically do is a single kind of a release case, and that's the most persistent oil type that's uh, either collected or transported in the pipeline system. We look at the worst case discharge volume as defined by FIMSA, that's the release time times the shutdown time times the flow rate. So actively pumping out until the pipeline is shut down and then allowing the volume within the pipe to release, which is the entire volume in the pipe. These volumes are, are very highly conservative. They are much larger than any volume you would anticipate to come out of these pipelines, but this is a conservative approach and would give you the, the, the safest way of saying, look, if these are the total number of resources that could be affected. Um, to maximize the amount of oil hitting the environment in the shortest amount of time, we basically make the spill duration near instantaneous and we run it out for 30 days. That's uh, another highly conservative assumption because now we're looking at oil moving throughout the environment for 30 full days, completely unmitigated, no emergency response tactics being employed. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to find out what's the maximum spatial extent oil could move should there be a release that was untouched. Um, in this case, we looked at seven years of spatially and temporally variable data. We had three, three dimensional, actually four dimensional temperature, salinity, currents and winds. And we marched that forward for a couple different example cases that I'd like to walk you through. Um, so some of the key results we provide, if you remember back to the is what and when questions is we provide that minimum time footprint. We, we can either show the probability oil would go in a direction or we could show the bullseye of here's the minimum amount of time it would take for oil to move out from the release location. And what we've done for a couple of these operators is cropped that to the first HCA impacted, right? I've got 30 days of results, but that's a little excessive because we know that's not a reasonable use case when emergency responders are typically out there in hours. Um, so the minimum time footprint tells us a little bit about what is affected. The, we can then take that data um, sort it with GIS and then basically identify out of the different HCA types, what is the minimum time to the first impact? And then what are the specific, say, location exactly or state to those receptors being employed? And this image on the left kind of demonstrates how the, the time progresses from this magenta about 12 hours into a release to the purple about 12 to 24 hours into a release to the blues, which is getting into the 48 hours into a release. And for a release in this offshore environment, we predicted that oil would impact um, an ecologically sensitive area to the north in about 48 hours, assuming that there was no emergency response mitigation. Um, so the conclusion from this was this pipeline segment or, um, or facility would be identified as a could affect segment because we did identify that a resource could be affected. We could provide just minimum times, we could provide put footprints, we could, we could provide any number of data. Another example in the inshore environment was looking at a release uh, from an example pipeline here. Um, and again, we were looking at how oil would progress in this nearshore environment. And here we're going from a magenta color and oil reaching these locations in less than an hour up to the first HCA impacted here another populated area within about 8.6 hours. But again, this footprint was cropped using GIS tools to essentially identify Here's the footprint at hour 8.6 when that first receptor was hit. Um, the footprint would very likely be much larger if we looked at the entire 30 day um, example. Um, additional HCA results were provided in wrap ups. We provide very short reports, very concise that can be delivered to FIMSA and this data can be imported into the pod system. Um, but we're again, providing minimum time footprints as GIS shapefiles of the full 30 day unmitigated simulations 
we're providing the same footprint, but for probability, uh, again, as a GIS shapefile for the full 30-day unmitigated simulation. And those results can then be used by the operator to crop and to, to play around with to help guide um, other decision-making within the company. The technical reports were short, less than 15 pages. A lot of that is figures, um, but it's provided for backup and auditing purpose. It includes a brief introduction, modeling approach, and then the scenario development, modeling assumptions, results right up, and then the conclusion, which honestly is about one sentence. It's whether or not this, recept this uh, pipeline or facility is a could affect segment. The operators we're working with are actually quite excited about using these tools, um, mainly because these results can be used to help guide many other things. Um, they've been used for emergency response training, exercises and drills, oil spill response plans, environmental assessments, and otherwise aligning with a consistent approach within the company. Uh, spill modeling is not new to this industry. It's been used for 40 years or more. And to have this kind of an approach developed in the offshore environment and to understand that we're going to do an HCA assessment as well as a couple other things with the same modeling results actually saves time and money at the end of the day. So what I've done is I've walked you through a little bit of that traditional on land versus our new offshore HCA approach, um, mainly because of the, the changing winds and currents and tides in the offshore environment. Um, the approach still holds in the, the traditional on-land assessment for those on-land facilities. It's, it's got singular paths. Uh, it, it mainly applies because the land surface elevation isn't changing very much throughout the year. So that, that works very well for that application. But when we start to put our eye towards the offshore as FIMSA had in the last year or so, um, and when we start looking at releases from pipelines, we do need to consider a little bit more um, comprehensive solutions like this approach where we're considering the dynamic environment, providing a range of results based on the different environmental forcing and the integration into different plans. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeff and I believe we're gonna have questions at the end of these presentations. So thank you very much for attending. Awesome, thanks Matt. Uh, great presentation. Uh, always fascinated by that topic. You know, as somebody who's who's done onshore HCA analysis and run that process, and somebody who loves to be out on the water uh, and know the you know live the dynamics of of, of wind and sea, it, it's really cool to see all that come together in, in that analysis. So uh, I'm sure we'll have some great questions for you at the end. And uh, just a reminder for the folks out there. Put those questions in the chat window, just identify them for, for Matt. And, uh, and when we bring Matt live back at the end, we'll, uh, we'll be able to chat with him some more on this. So the next presentation uh, I'm really interested in as well, it's, it's from Philip Blodin, uh, Blondin from Boardwalk Pipeline. Uh, Phil's been with, with uh, Boardwalk for 14 years now. He's part of the IT GIS team supporting creating uh, GIS for their, for their in-house business. And Boardwalk's been really in the middle of, a, of executing a multi-year approach to upgrading their system. And really what their goal was to try to reach out to a much wider audience within their organization. So Phil's gonna tell us a little bit about the history of those efforts, uh, what some of the experiences are, and then show us some real world examples of, of, the, of the, the web maps and, and dashboards and interfaces that he's built for his organization and moving that, at, you know, moving that core system of record information out and make it available to a much wider audience within Boardwalk Pipeline. So with that, I'd like to bring Phil in. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you know, Boardwalk would like to, uh, you know, show, showcase some of the GIS efforts that we've done in recent years today. And, you know, we had a plan. So our plan was to position Boardwalk as a leader uh, in GIS technology, but, you know, what, what does that mean? Does it mean we just want to to have that title? But no, we had a reason. We we wanted to increase collaboration between the departments and uh, situational awareness, and 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 you know create an environment of geographic driven uh, decision making. And you know why why do we want to do that though? So we feel the result would be a you know an advantage by the sharing of this this visual information and and seeing insights into data. And, you know, promoting the, you know, the safety of the pipeline assets and therefore, you know, increasing public safety uh, around the assets. Let's look at a timeline for Boardwalk. Starting in uh, or previous to 2012, 
we had multiple companies with different, you know, software and infrastructure, different databases, different pods, databases, different processes. Uh, you know, we have you know, different departments, we have different management structure. Uh, so, you know, if you think about that for a minute, minute it's uh, could be a little inefficient. But starting in 2012, we moved everything to, you know, the current version of Esri software to a common platform, single pods database, company agnostic tool sets for ACA and class, you know, pipeline maintenance and reports. Uh, you know, other applications such as, you know, alignment sheets. We also had a common entry point through the Amazon cloud and, and Citrix desktops. We had no more local installs. This was actually a performance advantage uh, for many users because we could open up one or more machines. We could run, you know, a heavy process on one and a user could edit edit data on another another machine. Uh, in 2014, uh, was a, a pretty big milestone for Boardwalk. That we had no web-based applications before that, but we did implement a Google-based solution uh, to make GIS data accessible to all company personnel <clears throat> through a web browser uh, or on a mobile phone. This really was the start of the, you know, a lot of GIS collaboration and awareness at Boardwalk. Because previous to that, it would have been uh, PDF maps or paper maps or you know KML files. So this was really the start uh, of seeing GIS data. Uh, you know, being able to pull that up on your phone, starting to see it in a, you know, in a, in a software application, it starts, it starts the users, it starts the, you know, users to, to think about things. It starts the, the light bulbs turning on. There were some limitations to, to this though. So in 2019, we implemented our GIS portal. At this point, you know, what did we want to do with that? We wanted to create a, you know, a collaborative GIS environment. We want to be users to be able to share GIS data and publish this data, consume data from other other sources into a one single application where they could you know, make their own maps, uh, look up data. They could uh, share other GIS information with other users. So we created one company wide mapping application in 2019. In 2020, Boardwalk had you know, increased uh, you know, GIS activity around TVC applications and, and corrosion and ILI. This was also the, the proliferation of, of dashboards that once the first one was created, uh, users, users could see the advantage that those, those had. And they, they started coming up with their own ideas and wanted to create, uh, many more of those to, to showcase data for their, for their managers or just high level statistical type information. And in 2021, we started with um, data synergies. We had increased collaboration. We also we also were investigating data integrations with other systems, and when we're also working on the development of a portal-based as-built project tracking system. In the next few slides, we'll we'll focus on the 2019 to 2021 uh, time frame in more detail. But in 2019, we we implemented a portal in an HA environment, AWS. Uh, so it handles uh, the failover for a reduced time, and we've nearly had 100% uptime since this implementation. One of the first times that we created in the 2019 implementation was a, a main company web mapping application. This application you know, allowed users to search data through uh, just a standard text search or map click search to view any of the record details, hyperlink documents, they could you know, create maps, you know, load KMLs, look at imagery, street view, pictometry. You know, they had other just standard tools such as you know, drawing graphics on the screen or, or you know, instances. So some of the standard widgets, uh, out of the box widgets, you know, they add data, uh, you know, drawing graphic tools and, and measure tools. We had, you know, you know, adding base maps. We also had a custom KML loader. And we also had a few other custom widgets, such as, you know, pictometry, integration with pictometry, and street view, hexagon imagery. Uh, created a profile widget on there for, for you know, reviewing hydro tests. You know, previous to that, uh, we had to, we went to Google Earth. We'd go outside of this and go to Google Earth, and a person would, would try to overlay something in there. So we had two different applications. So then we just implemented everything that, that users needed to do into one application. And from here, you know, the users can also you know, search for GIS data. They have you know, different methods of that. They can just do a straight text search, or they can start limiting those those searches to a specific layer or map extent. They can, you know, draw a user-defined polygon on the screen and uh, search for any type of GIS data. 
when a user does a search, it will return back uh, the search results grouped by the layer. If a, if a user needs to, you know, click on a map to return data, that is also supported. So with one single click on the map, up to you know, 70 data layers are returned, just whatever is found underneath that clicked point. All the data is all, you know, grouped by its type. So a user can, they know that, you know, ACA data is under, under ACA or centerline data is, is under the centerline header. Uh, from there, if, if a user needs to see more detailed information, they would just click on each, each one of the data headers and it would open up, you know, some of the features that are under it. And then from there, the features would have the record details. So users can then see how many features were, you know, under each one of the, the layers, open up the record details. They can zoom to those, flash the records if needed. We also have, uh, you know, supporting of hyperlinked documents such as valve maps, you know, as builds, MTRs, POs, all those are linked in with the GIS data from the document management system, and they will pull up as you know PDF documents, uh, you know, through this software. In 2020, we also had the focus on dashboards. The first one was the COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, you know, from here we we created a script that would download the John Hopkins data, and and do some spatial operations to update the numbers within a distance of boardwalk facilities. This was really the first one that was created. And from there, that's sort of when the light bulb started turning on to see use cases for GIS as well, as far as dashboards go. So now that we knew that we had map services running, feature services running, and we had, uh, you know, we had an avenue to create these, other users started to think about it as well. So not everything was coming out of, out of IT. Then we had a risk dashboard. We did not have that before. So now we can see risk by you know, area or company. We could have that, you know, what is the highest risk and what are the drivers? So these dashboards then could now consume data and analyze data and present it to the user. We created a FEMSA mega rule dashboard. Uh, this would show, you know, MAOP reconfirmation areas, HCAs, uh, assessments outside of HCAs or assessments outside of HCA areas. It'll show, you know, counts and numbers, schedules, uh, where they're located at. Uh, what area they're in, what pipeline they're on. Uh, you know, previous to this, it would have been spreadsheets. We also did a, an integration with another system, SCADA system. We started pulling that information in and to show, uh, you know, SCADA systems that are, that are down. Uh, a lot of this was, this was born from the event of all the, the hurricanes that we were having in 2020. Um, you know, previous to this, you know, we would just export out the data, the SCADA system and, and see what was down and we would give reports to management. Once, once we started thinking about it though, and we knew, well, this is just data. Uh, we set up uh, some geoprocessing services that would, would consume this data in. Uh, I mean, on top of that though, it also does some geoprocessing services with uh, the hurricane layer and it'll select sites that are, that are within a, a potential impact of those. You know, what did that lead to it? it you know, it, it helped with, you know, disaster preparedness. So before that, you know, you know, hurricanes would come in and they would, they would destroy things. So, so now at least we have some idea of what could be impacted and it's on the fly. So, so instead of having a spreadsheet, X, Y coordinates, try to make a layer from it, get with the GIS analyst. Hey, can you give me a, a PDF map back? Give me some list. Now you have something that's running constantly and it's in real time telling you what the what uh, a disaster could be so now we have advanced information and <clears throat> this is what we were talking about before with you know situational awareness this is a great example of that then we moved into the CIS area you know previous to to this application that we that we had is spreadsheets again so users would have spreadsheets from the vendors they would go through there and categorize it based on the criteria manage everything through a spreadsheet pass spreadsheets around in emails you know, now we have an application that can consume a CIS spreadsheet. It'll consume that and load it to a database, analyze the data on the fly, present it back to the user quickly. Previous to that, the user had to do everything manually. So now we have huge process improvements. A user can upload a survey from a standard CIS spreadsheet from a vendor. Once they have it loaded, they can just pick that survey, click analyze. What it will do is group 
the CIS data by category. In this case here, giving one example like the, the negative 850 criteria. Once it does that, it presents it back to the user and says, hey, these are the areas that we have found. These are the areas of interest. These are the amount of anomalies that we had. What do you want to do about it? So from there, the user can you know, look at the CIS chart. The CIS chart uh, is integrated with the map. So as you move up and down the chart, there's a red X on the, the pipeline that will move up and down and, and kind of pinpoint where these locations are at. From there, the user can pick uh, a potential remediation for that. So let's say we had you know, something with a negative 850, some criteria in there. Maybe they want to increase the CP or install a ground bed. So they can pick, so they can pick these potential remediations then, save those, just puts it as a schedule at that point. So now we have a list of recorded potential remediations. We have a corrective action, a compliance date who it's assigned to. Uh, you know, you can, you can think of this as like a BAP uh, for CIS. So basically you're picking an assessment. Then you're going to go do that assessment. And did that assessment, uh, did it correct it? So how do you do that? How do you know that? So this application supports, you know, follow-up surveys. So you just reload the confirmatory CIS. So you know that if you did increase CP or install a ground bed, you're going to do a follow-up uh, confirmatory CIS survey. And the user would just load that. And it's attached to that record. It analyzes the data again and returns it back. There's no anomalies found. So we know that this remediation activity corrected the problem and can be then closed out. You know, again, one of the beauties though of these systems with GIS data, uh, having the enterprise geo databases, map services running, feature services running. Again, we can create dashboards. So instead of a manager going to that application, trying to figure it out, trying to export something out uh, or filter data, they just go straight to the dashboard, high level right there on the spot. I see everything that's going on. This is, this is a really a huge deal for a GIS community, especially when you go from things like spreadsheets and paper maps that and everything's right there at your fingertips. It's, it's, a, it's a massive process improvement over, over previous activities. While we were working on the CIS data, we also moved into the anomaly dig area. So we would also, we also got, you know, you get vendor spreadsheets back of anomaly digs. When you run an ILI run, they say, okay, here's, here's, you know, some investigations that need to happen. Previous to this application, a user would uh, input that into an access database one at a time. <clears throat> so we decided to take that, move it into an enterprise geo database. It follows some of the same principles, but with process improvements. So at this point, a user can type in a, an XY coordinate to create an investigation from that. Uh, the application will, you know, select all the pipelines around that coordinate, return that to the user and say, which one is, which one is this anomaly supposed to be on? And when they pick that and create the investigation, you know, snap it to the pipeline and pull all corresponding map information underneath that point. That's, that's a pretty big improvement over a user uh, clicking on the map for each, each item, then going and typing it into a form. Now you have an automatic data retrieval. You also have increased accuracy from this because a user could input the wrong value, and now we're pulling what is, that, is exactly on the map. So what, what is another derivative work of this? Well, if you think about the PHMSA 7100 Part F, there's a lot of metrics there around anomaly digs, like in the calendar year of 2020 or 2021, how many, how many anomalies were remediated in an HCA? Well, we have all that information right there because it pulled it. So now you actually could create a dashboard that had those metrics on it. A user could just have a date filter on it and say for 2020, what are the metrics? And it would pull it up right in front of them. Previous to that, a user would have to get a download of the data, filter in Excel, they would type numbers in, add everything up. So now you, you're starting to see these, these huge process improvements. So these are the advantages that I'm talking about with the GIS system. Once that's input, we now have a recording of investigations. And then again, the dashboard it goes on a schedule. Managers, managers can come to the dashboard, see a high level schedule, see what's going on. What types of digs do we have? When are they going to happen? Where are they at? Who are they assigned to? Previous to that, what would they have? Hey, send me a spreadsheet and an email. Next week, send me another spreadsheet. Now they just go here. We also implemented a TBC application. This application is another portal-based application. 
that that reads data directly from pods. So it has a direct connection through geoprocessing services. It can read the pipe segment data, test pressure data and grandfather pressure data on the fly. It can also on the fly dynamically segment the data as well and present the view to the user. Users can, can attach documents so they can link those documents from the document management system. So all they have to do is go there they see it. There's a, a hyperlink address, they just attach it, that's it. So anytime they pull these records up, if they click on any of the records in here and go to the documents tab, all the documents are right there and recorded, recorded in front of them. All they do is click on it, it'll open them right up. There's a two-step validation process. So when a user selects you know, a pipe segment record or a test pressure record or a grandfather record, it pulls the pods data into the view and then they, they type in the data that um, uh, that is appropriate. If it's the same data, then you know they just click a, a checkbox at the top and it will fill everything out for them. And then they save the record. Once that happens, the next user can come in to validate the record. Once both sets of users have validated the record, it is then at that point TVC'd and ready to send the data to pods. It also keeps a, a history of user comments. So all the comments the users input are attached to that single record. Once complete and the data needs to move to pods, a user just clicks the send to pods button. It brings up a list of versions. You pick the version and moves straight into pods. This is a pretty big improvement previously because we had like we had SQL scripts that we would get uh, from another application and we'd have to take those scripts and apply those to versions. Someone would have to validate that. Uh, there would always be some kind of change. We'd have to go and, and revert back, change the SQL script, bring it back in. We don't have to do that now. Everything is validated through you know, a one-stop shop. You see it, it's been validated. You click a button and it moves it in. So what's gonna happen in Boardwalk in 2021? Well, we're starting to do some Maximo integrations. We have a, an effort between Boardwalk and ActiveG where we're pushing Maximo work orders into Portal. We've actually done that and implemented it. Uh, we're also working on an as-built, you know, project tracking portal application. This is a collaboration between Boardwalk and, and GeoJob. Uh, so we're integrated in a Oracle accounting system. Uh, we're also integrating with Pega, and it, it tracks compliance impacting type related projects such as reroutes and replacements and pressure tests. You know, things where we want to know a spatial location. You know, why do you want to know a spatial location? Well, because we want to support. Uh, the opportunistic dig, dig rule from the, the FEMS Omega rule. We'll also end up with another dashboard of metrics, you know, that show these are the pro these are the projects that are in process, what their progress is. If anything is delinquent or it has or it has some kind of error, like missing a document or a document's incorrect, all of that will be at high level, you know, metric information for managers. While this system is, uh, you know, recording and uh, and uh, you know, managing the information. You know, it also allows for you know automatic notifications to project managers. So this is a pretty big, a pretty big system that we're implementing as well this year. You know, just another improvement at, at Boardwalk. So as a recap, if you think about where we started at, you know, and where we're at now, it's just a, you know, a massive change. It went from desktop GIS, you know, spreadsheets. PDF maps, KMLs, and then the timeline starts. You know, you start having collaboration. You start seeing GIS awareness. You start bringing in a bigger group of people and they start, you know, they start talking about it. They start thinking about it, seeing things. There's a lot of visualization. They start saying, hey, they reach out to you. Hey, can we do something like this? I have an idea about something that would really improve our system. So it's really the, you know, the main thing is, what are you trying to do with this? You know, so at Boardwalk, we're trying to improve. We're trying to move forward. You know, we're trying to increase public safety. We're trying to make, you know, things that are unknown into a known as far as data goes. These systems are allowing us to be, you know, better and faster, you know, at what we do. It's bringing a lot of awareness to GIS, a lot of this geographic driven, you know, decision making. So if you you know, the last thing is, if you know, if you think about that, every single thing in the world, you know, has a spatial location. And, you know, every, everything 
and, and sometimes hard for me to comprehend why everything's not in a GIS system because every single thing is 3D. And when you move it in there, you can really visualize things. You can really have insights into data. You know, you can really make good decisions on what you're trying to do. Thank you. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Phil. Great presentation. Uh, always glad to see what you guys are doing there at Boardwalk. You know, I'm always really impressed um, when we when we see a company implement the portal and, and really kind of take off with it. You know, I think one of the things that I, I think about what comes to mind is, you know, there's an old saying that says, you know, you give a person a fish and you feed them for the day. Uh, if you teach them how to fish, you can feed them for a lifetime. Uh, every time I go back and visit with the guys at Boardwalk, they've built more stuff. They're rolling out new dashboards. They're rolling out new interfaces. And, and it's really exciting to see how, how an organization can kind of take that core technology that they have and then bring that to life inside of inside the organization. So let me um, kind of flip back over to my PowerPoint here for a second. We can bring that back up. Uh, I just want to remind you, I, I see some great questions coming in on the back end. So lots of lots of great, uh, great stuff coming in for the Q&A. So please, if you haven't joined the conversation, uh, enter your questions in the in the chat window. And uh, when we bring all the presenters in live at the end, we'll, we'll have some great feedback. So I already see some really good questions coming in. I can't wait to, to get there. So just a reminder on that. Uh, but really what I want to do now is transition over to, to Sean Holmes and Matt Gaffner. Sean uh, is with One Oak. Um, Sean's the uh, IT lead there. He specializes in, in building applications in the pipeline and energy infrastructure. And he's currently in charge of a, a team that's uh, in charge of maintaining the RGS enterprise services and integrations. Uh, Matt, Matt Gaffner is from DTN. He's got 15 years of using RGS software and a degree in meteorology. Um, he, uh, he leads a team that provides uh, data interfaces over 100 different weather feeds for, for, um, from services that uh, the pipeline customers can, can consume and start to use, that, use inside their organizations. So Sean and Matt are gonna be uh, telling us how One Oak has, has really come together with DTN and collaborated to enable an interface to make real-time decision-making for the field around weather data and proximity to key One Oak facilities. So this is severe storm warnings and potential lightning strikes and really kind of contributes to overall safety uh, culture at One Oak and, and how we can get this real-time information out to the rest of the organization. So with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Sean and Matt. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everybody. So my name is Sean Holmes, as Jeff has previously mentioned, and we also have Matt Gaffner on here. And we're going to be presenting uh, weather safety here uh, with Pipeline. The issue was that our environmental safety and health coordinators didn't have a good way to notify our employees of when severe weather and lightning was approaching our facilities. What we we're finding is that our ESNH coordinators we're using multiple sources of information for their weather and lightning needs. What we found was that some were using apps on their phone, other were using things on their computer, and some were just watching TVs. So what they figured was that GIS has all this weather information. Maybe we should approach them and see if they could provide an authoritative source of information for us. GIS has all this weather information ready available in our GIS portal and ready to serve up to the whole company. But the next thing they needed was the ability to send alerts. So they wanted to know when a lightning strike was, uh, was within a certain amount of distance from our facility. From there, they also needed to have logic of when the alerts were gonna be sent. So for instance, they don't wanna know when lightning is striking all across the country, but they don't, also don't wanna just know uh, they don't want to be repeated. Uh, they don't want to have repeated notifications over and over from the same storm. They want one notification when, when the uh, storm is approaching and lightning is struck, and then another notification 30 minutes after the last lightning strike has. So when looking at GIS, and as I mentioned before, we already have all the data in a single source. We need to find a way to be able to ingest all this data and send it all out. So we had a couple of options. And for that, I'll pass it to Matt Gaffner. So when we first started working with Sean and his colleagues at One Oak, 
there were <clears throat> two options that we presented that might be applicable to their use case. We have a software as a service application <clears throat> that comes with different alerting features. It's typically, back then, five years ago, when we started working with Sean, all we had was point-based alerting. We can now alert on polygons, but <clears throat> the alerts were limited to simply National Weather Service watches and warnings, lightning, and then DTN forecaster issued alerts, which are similar to uh, National Weather Service alerts, but they're a little more catered <clears throat> to our specific clients. In regards to the way that we can disseminate alerts, we can send those out via email, SMS, or a mobile application that we provide. <clears throat> the other option was for One Oak to leverage GeoEvent and simply use data services that we provide on our ArcGIS server. So the GeoEvent option would really give One Oak the ability to leverage all of the time and effort they've put into mapping all of their assets and facilities, whether they're static or dynamic, um, they can monitor you know, mobile assets as well. <clears throat> they can also utilize GeoEvent for things other than lightning um, and, and National Weather Service alerts. They could use things like our rainfall estimates to create threshold-based alerting. So for instance, if flooding at a facility might be a concern, they might wanna look for um, an asset that's had more than six inches of precipitation in a day, um, which isn't something that we could do out of the box. <clears throat> in addition, with GeoEvent, there's easy ways to archive data with Big Data Store um, so that they can keep those and have a record, something that they can go back to if there's an incident. And the big, um, another big plus to the GeoEvent server side of things was that it would really minimize the number of business systems keep everybody using one authoritative source and, and then kind of limit the number of screens that people have to utilize. So that's ultimately why One Oak went with the data services that we provide from our ArcGIS server in combination with GeoEvent. So as, meant, as Matt mentioned, GeoEvent was ultimately selected uh, due to our already existing ArcGIS enterprise setup and the customizability and extensibility that we could uh, continue on with. So what I wanna do is actually dive into our setup. How did we do this? So to the right, what you'll see is a screen capture of our actual geo event process running that's running these alerts. One thing to note here is that geo event is ingesting thousands of records every minute. As we can see with storms that pop up, there are thousands of lightning strikes that can happen within a short time frame. So it needs to be able to take in large amounts of data. And what we can see at the beginning here is that all we've done is just set up to ingest DTN's already existing ArcGIS services. These are just plug and play with no additional configuration needed. All we did was simply add them to our GeoEvent server and they're ready to go. What you'll notice here is that we are monitoring both cloud to cloud lightning strikes and cloud to ground lightning strikes. The next thing we did is we set up a GeoFence around our One Oak locations. So what we did is we built polygons around our plants in certain offices on our whole footprint that needed to be alerted on. From there, what we could do was with every lightning strike that came in through the GeoEvent service, we buffered that by a set distance that our ESNH coordinators wanted. From there, we then looked, did that buffer intersect one of those previously mentioned geofences? If it did, what we did is we took that strike time from that lightning strike and we ride it to the geofence. So for instance, if a lightning strike struck at 7, 10 p.m., that 7, 10 p.m. time is physically written to the uh, geofence itself. From there, what it does is we have another service inside GeoVent that's monitoring all our geofences looking for an updated strike time. When it sees that new strike time come in, it knows to send an alert. But then this is where it gets a little interesting because we don't wanna just keep sending alerts with every single lightning strike. So we need to have a logic to go uh, alert on the first lightning strike, but don't alert on subsequent lightning strikes until it's been 30 minutes since a lightning strike has struck. So what we do there is we've actually set up on our geofence an email flag. So when the new time is written to the geofence, it sends the email and flips the flag saying, I've alerted on this storm. Then subsequent strikes 
uh, all that happens is that strike time is written to the polygon over and over and over, resetting a timer on that polygon. So for instance, if the first strike was at 7.10, it sends the alert. And then we have another strike come in at 7.12. It, all it's doing, it's writing that 7.12 to the polygon, but it's not re-alerting because it's saying, I've already sent one alert. Then what we do is we have a process that's checking that geofence and comparing it to the current time. So what we do is over time, once a minute, we have it looking at the current time on the server and comparing that to the strike time on the polygon. Once that's reached 30 minutes, it then sends an all clear email and resets that notification flag so it can, reset, so it can notify again in the future. So here's what comes out. When we use GeoVent, we can send emails. And what's nice with these emails is that we can actually write in uh, specific information into the email that is applicable to the end users. What we'll see on the left here is an example email that gets sent when lightning has struck near a facility. What's great about this is that this email has the ability and the right to stop all work. So this is something that One Oak worked with our environmental safety and health coordinators to make sure that it is written in procedure, that if a lightning email is sent, it has the authority to stop work at any facility. So what we can see here though, is outside of it just sending an email saying that lightning has been detected and to stop work, what you'll notice is that we can dynamically write in what the geofence name is. For instance, this one is the One Oak Plaza facility. This makes a more targeted email for end users that grabs their attention rather than just a generic email that says lightning has been detected, please stop work. If we can call out their facility, they know it's for them and they know there's action to be had. The next thing we do at the end is we can provide a live weather uh, map to our internal GIS portal. So this lets the users go in and assess the situation on a live map and see how bad the storm is, what's going on, and try to get more context as to why an email was sent to them. So looking at our live map here, we can see we can provide a lot more context to our field users and environmental safety and health coordinators. We look at this map, you can see here's our pipeline and these labels here in the middle are the geofences that we had set up. You can see we have some in Mont Bellevue up to what the Oak Plaza in Tulsa and Hutchison, but we're also providing other layers which I'll have Matt Gaffner speak to. So Sean's map provides a really good example of the full spectrum of weather data services that we provide. We've got everything from data services that are commoditized like the National Weather Service watches and warnings, radar data that we add value to and lightning as well. And so with the National Weather Service watches and warnings, we're able to provide those in a low latency method that's reliable. And we've got 24 support for those services, which can be you know, health and safety related. <clears throat> so, you know, compared to free services that may be out there, you know, getting a, a winter weather watch five minutes late is normally not a big deal and nobody's going to get hurt. But getting a tornado watch or a tornado warning rather five minutes late could be a big deal to the health and safety of employees. So those are the kind of things that we do to improve commoditized data services like the National Weather Service watches and warnings. But then for things like the national or the radar data, DTN puts in a lot of work to remove clutter um, to make it so you don't have to be a meteorologist to know that what you're looking at is precipitation. On top of that, we add a precipitation mask. So you know whether it's rain, sleet, freezing rain, um, or snow, which at least luckily today, we've got an example of all of that. Uh, on the live map here. And then to go beyond data sets that DTN adds value to, we also have proprietary data sets like lightning, hail, uh, where tornadoes have been, all of which are things that are unique and proprietary to DTN that we create and make available on our ArcGIS server as well. So when working with Sean, uh, we both kind of learned some lessons together, um, which it was really good to be able to work with a, a close customer and kind of run into the same issues that we could help each other solve. And so one of the things uh, that was really important was ensuring that whenever 
Sean was setting up their geo event server that <clears throat> the cadence for making requests for data was appropriate. Um, the most frequent data like lightning updates once a minute, other data sets <clears throat> only update you know, every five minutes and even some more that we didn't even talk about only update every three to six hours. So there's really no need to set the cadence to check for new data every second, maybe not even every minute, um, when you could do it every five, 10 minutes, or even an hour, depending on what data service you're looking at. And that really improves performance by limiting network traffic. And then the other thing um, that I think Sean and I both experienced when working with GeoEvent is we were trying to use the polygons, like the National Weather Service watches and warnings as a geofence, because we thought of it as a, as a two-dimensional area. Um, and then once we started using the actual locations that we cared about as the geofences and intersecting them with the weather data, we were able to get what we wanted out of the geoevent services that we were setting up. So the other thing that uh, I think one of the main takeaways from this process is that we also now have a skeleton for other alerting processes. So today, all we went over was our lightning notification service. We've also applied this to severe weather and floods. As we see regulations continue to, to pop up over time, such as the new one to, to check out a facility uh, within 72 hours after a severe weather event, we start to see this become more and more important. So when we set up these other services, such as severe weather, tornado watches warnings, hurricane watches warnings, flood watch warnings, um, and th those type of uh, uh, items, all we did is we used the same skeleton that we applied from our lightning data set. The inputs are basically the only thing that changed. We may also change the frequency of notification um, and some other small details, but from then on, it's more just plug and play. The other thing we could do is we could start to integrate it with other systems into our GIS. So for instance, we use it for our, uh, our employee locations. We have an integration with Verizon Connect, which shows live uh, employee data uh, from their vehicles. So that if a weather event is approaching, we can see who the nearest employee is who's qualified to go inspect a, a location. The last uh, use we have here is for our pipeline control. This has been great for them to get an alert and be able to look into something real time from the control center itself. With that, they have a one-stop authoritative place where they can go see our One Oak assets, live weather data, employee locations, and other information that they need to know. With that, I thank you for your time. Back to you, Jeff. And, you know, I think, you know, we looked at, you know, analytics, we looked at sharing collaboration, and this is a great example of, of what customers are doing with real-time data. You know, back to that, that start of my presentation when I said, you know, we think about the physical assets, then we add real-time data to those, right? Or bring those maps alive, as somebody, somebody said to me once. And it doesn't just have to be SCADA. And this is a great example of where they're using weather data and people location and having those sort of, all those sort of IO sensors out there bringing data into these maps and really making the picture come alive and and really bringing a whole different level of value to the organization around how they're utilizing the GIS system and how they're how they're enabling people in the organization to make smarter decisions about day-to-day -day work activities and so kind of continuing on with that that um, that idea I do want to bring to the stage uh, Derek Pickett and Daniel Price. Uh, they're going to talk about the project that they did at Enterprise for around field mobility, right? So uh, now we're transitioning into the into this idea of of taking data from that core enterprise system and and moving it out to the field. So Derek's been a lead IT project specialist at at Enterprise Products uh, since 2013, and he's uh, led a variety of IT projects, including uh, legal, environmental, and safety. And, and accounting projects. And really this project fell into his lap because it was a replacement of a legacy mobile application that they were working on. And, um, and Derek and team turned to global information systems to help them uh, implement this solution. And Dale was a project manager for Global who uh, has over seven years of experience in the pipeline industry. And, and she's gonna talk about some of the backend architecture that was put into place to, to support this. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Derek and, and Danielle to tell their story. Well, thanks, Jeff. 
Um, we're going to talk to you this afternoon about our ArcGIS implementation. Um, what we did internally is we renamed the collection of applications under ArcGIS to EMAP. That's what our um, internal folks know the system as. And so we're going to talk to you about EMAP. And we... Uh, we found ourselves, unfortunately, in the position that our current uh, software, which was XMAP, uh, had come to end of life. The company had been acquired by some by another company, um, and then further to that, uh, Microsoft also no longer supported the application in their operating system. So we we've effectively found ourselves with a, an application which needs to be. Um, renewed and quickly replaced, um, the, the, the need was urgent, particularly because of the, the issue that we might have received patching from Microsoft, um, which could have really killed the application right off right there and then. Um, so we collaborated with uh, Global Information Systems, also known as Global, on finding a, an alternative solution. We conducted some very detailed surveys with our field staff uh, and GIS worked with us on that, Global worked with us on that. Um, and we determined functional requirements for the field. So we kind of took a fresh look at what exactly does the field need rather than just copying what we had with XMAP. So our end users are line locators, that would be pipeline locators, if you will, and also corrosion technicians. and. There was about 950 users in all. Um, and so far, we've actually rolled out all of those 950 users. Um, and Global worked with us. They configured the system and supported our rollout project. All right. So with keeping those key requirements um, in mind, we, we realized that uh, Collector and Explorer would pretty much cover every requirement that, um, that they the users said they they needed. Um, so, you know, Collector allows you to view and capture data. Explorer allows you to, to view the data. Explorer gives you the ability to do that markup, which is a really key piece for the end users. Um, and then both, both um, applications give you the ability to work in an online and offline setting. All right, so the part of the implementation that feeds Collector and Explorer is the, the more back office part that the end user doesn't see, but it's what's required to, to have the implementation, do the implementation, is that web services and web maps. So um, we use web services for all of the data that is um, feeding the web maps, uh, and then we created multiple web maps. Um, some of them are just for online use and those cover the entire system. And then we also have a series of maps that are broken down into areas so that they can be used in an offline um, setting. And we did that so that a user isn't downloading so much data to their individual device and having to keep up with that. Um, another, another piece that we did was doing pre-planned areas to reduce the amount of time that the end user has to spend prepping their data um, and allowing them to focus more on their job and what, they, what they're going out to do. Um, so those pre-planned areas really help with that, um, with that need. All right, thanks, Danielle. So in terms of user feedback, we got lots of great feedback from our users. Um, We've been using the product now for about six to eight months live, I think. We did a, a gradual ramp up. Um, and some of the big things that uh, came from our user community were that they, they loved having the availability of the portal, uh, something they hadn't had before, the ArcGIS portal, so that they could actually view data while they're in the office and in the home office when they're not actually out in the field working. Uh, that was a big benefit to them. Um, and Daniel just talked about the pre-planned areas. That was definitely um, a big one. That cut down a lot of work for these guys, being able to pre-plan those areas out ahead of time. 
um, cut out a lot of admin time. Um, and I, uh, the next one is that uh, they, they loved having up-to-date imagery. And when I say they loved having up-to-date imagery, I mean they loved it. The uh, imagery that we had out there was at least two years old, so they were struggling with that. Um, they also uh, very much liked having the offline viewer. That, that was well-received. Um, from a company viewpoint, a big positive is that we can add more users and maps, which is actually what we're in the process of doing right now. We have a number of different users across the company, uh, so we'll be extending the, the product to them. Um, some other things, um, easy to find required asset data on the maps. Um, we were able to add more data. The inclusion of test stations on the maps was a big one, and also the attributes for our corrosion department who previously did not have, they had a, an old homegrown application. They weren't even using XMAP. So that was a big step forward for these guys. Um, and also then finally the offline map viewing capabilities went down very well. So that's some of the feedback. Um, where we're going next, we actually have two pilots in process right now. Our land department have just ramped up their pilot. They started with, um, around six or seven users. They've now got around 20 to 25 people using the system. And the measurement department have just begun a pilot. Um, we are planning at some point to move to field maps. We've seen previews of it. Um, very much uh, are excited about that. Um, and we're currently moving. We have many users still using laptops out in the field, believe it or not. Um, and we are gradually moving them kicking and screaming across to the iOS versions. Um, and then uh, finally, um, our XMAP product, we are hoping then to turn that off uh, by September, by which time we'll have all of our users moved over. And that's pretty much our story, our ArcGIS, ArcGIS implementation story. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Danielle. That's a great story and, and a, a pattern that I kind of see repeating in the pipeline industry where, where organizations have some legacy mobile computing applications, whether they are homegrown or from other companies that are no longer providing those services and moving those over and, and standardizing on, on some of the Esri out-of-the-box technology. And I, I think the thing that's important to remember here is because that technology is already baked into the overall ArcGIS enterprise, I, I usually refer to it as the plumbing is already in place, right? We can move data back and forth to the mobile devices. We can go online, we can go offline. All that stuff exists. You're just basically baking into the product a configuration of what your field users are able to, to view and then be able to kind of rinse and repeat that cycle for other other folks in the organization. Uh, Derek also mentioned looking at field maps. That's another area that I'm seeing a lot of a lot of excitement around if people want to, to sort of modernize and, and consolidate some of these applications into a single app uh, that allows you to do viewing, redline markup, data collection, smart forms, all in all in a single interface. So, uh, so great job on that mobile application. And I know there's probably some great questions out there for you guys uh, as we go forward. So. Uh, don't forget to, to enter those last couple of questions for me into the chat window, uh, so we can we can have some dynamic conversation at the end. I won't bug you again. We're getting towards the towards the latter half here, so so thank you very much for those who have already uh, participated in the in the Q and A piece for me. Uh, but our last presentation is from Edward Fjordstein of Bar Air Patrol. Uh, Edward's a chairman of Bar Air Patrol since, and he's been there since 2015. He's been working on, on developing sort of new technologies and expanding on their company's um, offering to the telepipeline industry. And so Bar has been, uh, is really interesting because they were using a camera mounted onto their aircraft and, and actually capturing imagery during the aerial patrol uh, process, right? So uh, for all of us who have been involved in that process, it's usually been a, a pilot sort of taking notes as he flies along the corridor and then translating those to the field crews to go do an investigation. And these guys have figured out how to how to take that uh, that process and add sort of real-time imagery to that. And working with Barb, we figured out how to take that imagery and ingest it into the GIS. Uh, so I'm really interested about this. We're going to kind of tag team this last section. Uh, Edward's going to talk about their process and, and the equipment. And I'm 
and then I'm going to show you a quick demo afterwards of, of how we leverage uh, that those images coming off that aircraft uh, in the ArcGIS platform. So with that, I'll turn it over to Edward. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to Esri for giving us the opportunity to present here today. It's a pleasure to be with all of you virtually, and I look forward to meeting all of you in person when circumstances allow. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the Talon 360 system providing in enhanced intelligence for corridor surveillance. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on Bar Air Patrol and on Pipeline Patrol. Bar Air Patrol has been around since 1940, providing uh, pipeline patrol in support of 49 CFR 192 and 195. And for those who are not familiar, uh, the regulations state for that for hazardous liquid, oil, and similar type of product, the pipelines must be patrolled 26 times per year, no more than 21 days apart. Our best customers will patrol twice a week, some weekly, and worst case, every other week. And for gas, the regulations are a bit different, and some will patrol weekly, some monthly, and some quarterly. We have uh, 43 aircraft based at 22 locations nationwide. We fly over 2.2 million miles of corridor protection every year and over 20,000 hours at 500 feet. And we're especially proud of our safety program, which is the industry leading program. And we've had a fully functioning safety management system since 2008. We also have six aircraft that are focused on remote sensing. Uh, primarily collecting LIDAR, which takes very precise me measurements of the elevation of the earth, which has many use cases for our pipeline customers, as well as methane leak detection, where we can detect uh, 50 to 100 skiff or one to two kilogram per hour or greater flow rate. And because we're able to fly at 3000 feet, we can also get imagery of the line to satisfy high consequence areas and class location structure count work. So moving to the Talon 360 system, when you fly a typical pipeline patrol, the aircraft is at 500 feet, offset 50 to 200 feet to the right of the line with the pilot looking down to the left, looking for encroachments along the right of way. As they see encroachments, the observer will communicate those down to the ground, uh, either through text messaging, electronic apps, one call ticket, uh, that we can originate in the cockpit. The idea of the Talon 360 system was pretty simple. You're already flying these patrols anyway. Why not add imagery that's being collected every moment of the patrol? And that imagery has a lot of very valuable use cases for the pipeline operators. So we spent two years developing the system. We first of all, had to find a system that could fire fast enough as we're going 150 miles an hour when we have a tailwind that could rotate and follow the center line as we twist and turn and could deal with going from very low lighting conditions when we have an overcast to clear skies. And last and most importantly, uh, was FAA approved. So if you look at this pod in the picture on the left, the head of the pod actually rotates and follows in its flight management system, the center line of the pipeline. The pilot and crew can do their normal visual DOT observations while the system is tracking every moment of the patrol. The resolution is five to six centimeters, but we can get as low as three centimeters if the customers desire. As we start to look at use cases, <clears throat> the, uh, the first and foremost most valuable is that it can all be uploaded into the Esri oriented imagery viewer. And we're able to overlay the center line of the pipe, which really helps <clears throat> the customer identify how, how big of a threat the encroachment is. So if you look at the image on the left, on the left side, you see the Esri base map with the center line of the pipeline going north south in the picture. The green is the projections of the images that came off the camera. As you click on one of them where the red X is, you're able to bring up the image. You can see this retention pond. And by being able to overlay the center line, you can see that this is clearly a threat if it's not something that had already been detected. For the field crews, when they get an image from the air and they don't have the benefit of the accurate location on the line, 
the airplane being offset 50 to 200 feet, when they push a GPS pin, they're trying to then move that pin to where they think it happened on the line. But a lot of time can be wasted in the field by not having the accurate coordinates of where it is. At the same time, a high-res image can help a field crew realize that this sighting has already been seen the prior week or the prior month and is not something they actually have to go out and investigate, saving significant time. All the imagery is loaded up into a library that can be searched last week, last month, last year, as far back as you want to go. If field crews come upon an incident and want to understand when it happened, they can look back at prior images, uh, imagery. They can also take imagery on the ground of a location where they see an incident and upload that into the ESRI-oriented imagery viewer. And you can compare the aerial image to the image taken from the crews on the ground. This imagery is also very valuable for proof of patrol with regulators to show that you actually perform the patrol where the aircraft actually was, what it actually saw, what was or was not actually present on the patrol. And as far as 21 day compliance for DOT, if there are any areas that were missed because of weather, the system will alert you to what is nearing its 21 day compliance. Another great use case, as you can see in the image on the left is vegetation management. We have a right of way here with a, with a bend and you can see the center line clearly overlaid right through the center. As you're trying to figure out what areas of the center line might need, uh, what areas of the right of way may need to be cut back for vegetation management, trees, dead trees across the right of way, debris on the right of way, you would get a very clear uh, image and a very clear understanding of where it is relative to the center line. We can also use this imagery to document all the structures along the right of way. If a landowner says that shed has been there for 20 years, you can clearly show them exactly when they built it. We can also use this to classify vegetation. Uh, is it heavily wooded? Is it, uh, is it, is it open area? Uh, is it clearly viewable by the pilot? We have customers that are looking at using this for uh, for uh, um, identification of vehicles or company equipment or infrastructure along the right of way. They can put decals on their equipment. They can verify that contractors are where they say they're supposed to be. And if there's an area of interest or an area of concern, a river crossing, some company infrastructure, we can have the aircraft loop around that and create a 3D model that's fully metriced and ingestible into ESRI that can, that can be shared with contractors, that can be used by people at corporate to understand the full dimensions of the conditions on the ground. And that's extremely useful after a, a natural disaster. Last, we'd like to talk about AI and change detection. We've been flying these systems for 21 months now. We have eight aircraft weekly that are flying them and working with others on POC. But when you're flying the entire system and imaging it every single week, it provides an extremely rich data set that we can use to train the algorithms. And those algorithms can identify encroachments along the right of way that maybe are missed on patrol. As you look at the image on the left, you can see the digging equipment that's just underneath the line. You can even see some, some rubbish that uh, was left uh, just beneath the line as well. And hopefully the pilot will spot that, but you have an extra set of eyes with the AI and change detection. Sometimes there are releases in low lighting condition and the AI can be very helpful with that, spotting dead vegetation and also gradual changes that aren't as noticeable to the visible eye like erosion or geohazards. The AI can also help classify the vegetation, help identify areas that need trimming, we can work with Esri to extract the images, uh, ex excuse me, to extract the structures for better identification, especially since the imagery is on the oblique. And we can identify, as you see in the left side of this picture, we can identify company infrastructure, whether for counting it or any other purpose, even pipeline markers, we're able to see where they're missing or where they might need to be uh, repaired. So at the end of the day, uh, these patrols are being flown anyway, and we feel that uh, adding imagery provides 
enhanced intelligence that can be very valuable to uh, our clients as they are figuring out how to best protect uh, their infrastructure. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff and thank you for your time today. Cool, thanks, Edward. Uh, I know we're running a little bit late on the sessions this morning. We're, we're still having the, the full Q&A, so please hang in with us. Um, I've got one more thing I wanna show you here bef before we switch over to the live, the live session. Um, so as Edward had mentioned, you know, we take this imagery in and we load it into the platform. So I wanna kind of give you a real live view of what that looks like. And, and the reason that we're using this capability of the platform, this object-oriented or viewer, uh, an object-oriented catalog is because this imagery doesn't have side lap, it doesn't have overlap, it's flown quite fast, so we, we can't ortho-rectify it. You know, we just can't take these images and put it through some type of process and make a base map. So we have to take a process that understands the tilt, rotation, location of the airplane and crank on that math and figure out how that image that was taken projects uh, on the face of the earth. So let's take a look at how that looks like. So here we've got some pipeline that was flown and we've actually got some observations uh, tagged to the right of way here. So if we pull this up, it says, okay, there was an issue here with, um, uh, there was seen some excavation was seen with a timber road access along the street right away, right? And obviously if we look just at the Esri base map, we're not really seeing you know, what's going on. So what we can do here is we can actually tag right into the object energy catalog. So in, th in this example, I'm pulling up the catalog from, uh, from my portal and I'm gonna add that to the map. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna pull in all those footprints uh, that Edward talked about. So these are all the aerial patrol images. These green boxes represent the extent of all those images along the right of way. So if I zoom back into that location and I simply click on a location on the map, Let's click right here. What this will do is it'll search the catalog and bring up the image in question. So you can see it's obviously oriented. And if I move this window aside, you can see the extent of that image on the map. And I can even turn off those green boxes to make that a little clearer. And the cool thing is, is if I zoom in on the image here, you can see the extent of that is, is going to change. And I can zoom right in here now and I can see exactly what the pilot saw. So on 228, they were doing some type of construction here uh, along the right of way. And the really cool thing is I can go here and I can actually add the center lines and project them right onto this image. So now I can see exactly where our pipelines are in that right of way, where that construction digging was. And you could even see that uh, that timber road that they built on the other side of the, of the road here going across. Um, and so I could then, you know, really use that information to, to call out to the field crews and tell them exactly what we're seeing. And uh, you can see if I if I hold down my 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 button here, my alt button here, and I just click on the map, I can place images or I can place points in the photo and it'll actually project that onto the map in real time where that location was. So I can go and do, I can do measurements here, or I can take that point and, and send it out to the field crew. But the really cool thing is that I, I can then actually look in the catalog over time. So right now I'm viewing the image from 228, but we actually flew this pipeline a, a couple of weeks later. And if I pull up that image, I could see that same exact area, that same point on the maps that I created, but now I'm seeing what it looks like in real time. And now this tells a much different story. So we saw that uh, those crews sort of digging those pylons, and now we can see exactly what happened. These guys were installing a, some new uh, electric transmission towers, and a couple of weeks later, they're, they're completed and, and put in. Um, but we, we also see that there's, there's still some excavation equipment, even at 428, sitting on the right-of-way. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, is this just restoration going on or is this some more activity? Um, and so the really cool thing is this oriented imagery catalog not only applies to things like this, this aerial photography, but I can also integrate this with quick capture. So if I had our field crew go out in the field uh, with their iPhone and take a, a, a photograph of the same location, what I can do is I can switch my catalog and I can pull up my oriented imagery catalog from my, from my, uh, my field crews. And here I can actually see where their coverage map was and where the photo was taken from. 
So I have another photograph now of that same area. And of course, it's taken with my iPhone. So it's a much smaller, smaller scale. But again, I can do the same thing. I can click on this location here and pull up an image of exactly what that field crew saw in the field. So there's a there's a current image of that excavator in the field, exactly where it was. Again, I can hold down the button here, sort of X marks the spot of where that excavator is and see that. So a lot of different use, interesting use cases here of, of pulling together this information, both from aerial photography or terrestrial or drones or anything that has this sort of oriented image uh, that we can read the metadata about location, tw tist and twist twist and tilt of the imagery and then overlay this on on the on the imagery. So I think there's a lot of really cool use cases here of, of using this imagery for like uh, Edward explaining imagery uh, recognition and capture, maybe even looking at things like eight MCAs at road crossings to see how many how many uh, lanes of pavement we have at any given location uh, and really making this this data from the field or, uh, ever, or from the aerial patrol, ex readily accessible for the field crews, and then merging that with their information as well. So, I know there's a uh, hopefully there's some a lot of good questions coming on this. I think this is a, a great new capability of the platform. Uh, so, with that, let me uh, go back over and um, let's kind of bring in all our panelists now. We're going to switch over to our kind of live Q and A session. Hey, everybody. Can we hear everybody? Awesome, Bill, excellent, excellent. So thanks everybody for, for joining in the live Q and A. Uh, we'll, 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 keep it, uh, we'll keep going here. We've got a, I'm just pulling up the, uh, the Q and A questions that have been, the team's been creating in the background for me. Uh, just one more second for this to come up. So I, I know um, while waiting this work up, I'll remember one of the questions. So, so, um, So Matt, uh, Matt Horn, off to you first. One of the questions that came into your presentation was, um, have we really seen a sort of validation of what's going on between the, um, the results of the modeling and what we've seen in the real world, right? Have, we, have, you, have you been able to sort of say, hey, this is what we predicted. And then unfortunately there was an incident and, and this is what happened in real life. And, and how do those two kind of come together? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can. I can hear you great. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so actually, all of the RPS models that I presented here, the oil map land and the SIMAP model, have actually been validated against real world releases. Um, specifically in the, the um, I guess, the most notorious release was the BP release into the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And we actually worked on that case um, for about six years with the Department of Justice and EPA and have validated not only the trajectory, but also the fate processes and the potential effects that were predicted from them. So SIMAP has not only been validated in the offshore environment with Deepwater Horizon, but also in uh, more coastal releases like the North Cape spill in Rhode Island, as well as inland releases in the, um, in the regions of Washington and Delaware and some of those other rivers like the Columbia River. Oil map land has also been validated. Uh, that's a two-dimensional overland trajectory and fate as well as in water. Um, it is validated for the on-land releases. It's a little bit less detailed. It's a, it's a oil spill response planning software. So the answers are a little bit higher level, but yes, both of those tools have been validated against real world releases. Very cool, very cool, awesome. Well, I've got all my questions up and running here now. We had a had a great. We won't get them all. We'll, won't get to all of them, I'm sure. But there's some really good ones in here. So, um, so the next one, I'll, I'll move over to you, Phil. Um, next one is is uh, on your dashboards. Uh, there's some interest here, on, and you you mentioned the proliferation of those dashboards. Um, how are you How are you building those? Are you letting users build their own dashboards? Is that supported by a central team? Like what's What's the kind of cadence for, for build it when you guys get a request in for a, a new map or a new dashboard? How are you kind of going through that process?
Oh, we're not hearing Phil's, Phil's audio. Well, while we sort out Phil's audio, we'll, we'll circle back uh, and uh, we'll get that answer answer from Phil. So, um, Sean, can I, we got you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Thanks, cool. And and Matt as well? Cool. Yeah, I can uh, hear yeah. you. Yeah. Awesome. For, so, super. So, um, so Sean, the, the next question is off to you. The, um, you guys had talked about those weather alerts around critical facilities. Have you have you looked or thought about extending it out to the entire field crew, like other locations? Yeah. So right now it, it's kind of on a, a user by user basis. We let the uh, ESNH manager at each facility decide if they want to to utilize our alerts. But again, kind of as we said in the presentation, the skeleton's already there. So if uh, somewhere else wants to be included on those on those alerts, all we have to go do is go add in that new geofence, and then and then they're set up and ready to go. Cool, awesome. Which and Sean, do you guys have AVL data that you could theoretically use? We don't, but yes, uh, theoretically we could ingest that and and then use it and call it good. I know I, you know, living here in North Texas uh, for the first time in my life, I've, I've seen all kinds of crazy weather events that I never saw up in the Boston area come rolling through here. Uh, I, I imagine that this has been pretty, uh, pretty invaluable for you over the last couple of months. We seem to have a pretty, pretty hectic spring uh, weather events rolling through at least North Texas and up through up through your area. So, um, have, have you seen the the system come to life in the last uh, couple of months? Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've actually thought about putting it on my own house so I can get my own house. <laughs> uh, But uh, yeah, so and, and, and I'll say it's one of those things that's been growing pretty organically for us uh, because there's there's so much value in it in, in the people who are informed early versus the people in operations who aren't uh, that they start to talk to each other. And especially during the springtime, uh, that's when the emails start rolling back in of, Hey, uh, I heard you know place X has has alerting. Can we get that same thing? And then what's great about it with, with GeoVent using the DTN services is I again we can set it up in less than a day, and and then their minds kind of blown that like all right you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Awesome. Cool. Hey Phil, I think we've got you back. I think so. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So. Um, uh, on the dashboards, uh, really two groups, uh, create those, the GIS group. And then, uh, we also have an IT GIS group as well. What, what we had done though, was, uh, just, we started holding, uh, some meetings with uh, company personnel and just showcasing, uh, you know, some of the, the new items in the GIS environment and, and just started soliciting for their, for their opinions on it and, and what, what else could be done. Um, so then the user started reaching back out and saying, well, I think, uh, you know, we, we have, we have these reports that, uh, that we give out and we hand out every week that really, if we just had this in a dashboard, the users could then just go to the dashboard and they would, we would no longer have to create the report. Uh, so we, we have, we've been having a lot of activity around, around things of that nature. So we have, uh, we just created one for like a gas control uh, service requests where we have outages and things like that. And that, that was a report um, that that group would maintain and send out. So we've now done an integration with the Maximo system to pull it over and show those outages on, on a schedule. Uh, so once once it started with uh, users seeing things, it's like like I said in my presentation, that really that really did get the light bulbs going. And, 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 and users started to think about it, to be kind of engaged with it. Um, uh, a lot of things around the FEMSA mega rule have been created by the GIS group. Uh, they came out of pipeline, our pipeline safety group. Um, we're just now though getting ready to start uh, trying how to manage that because things are really taking off, and uh, you know how how to how to manage how to manage the apps and how 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 to display those inside of portal. Uh, 
to keep them separated from other other applications. Awesome. Well, I, you guys are doing a great job over there. I'm, I'm always impressed when I see what you guys have done. And every time I come back, there's, there's more stuff going on and, and more apps built. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where you, where you guys are heading next. Um, like next I, set of questions. Like I said, okay. I, I was just going to say, like, all a person has to do is see something. Um, just like when you guys got with us right before COVID hit, we hadn't built a dashboard. All we, we saw one dashboard. And then it took off. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that was uh, we saw quite a bit of that as as well. Um, even even beyond the pipeline industry, you know, when I was talking to my friends back home, and my dad said, "Hey, you know that map that comes up on the news every night? Yeah, that's an Esri dashboard. That's a map. That's that's what I do." He's like, "Oh, that's what you now. I finally know what you do. <laughs> it's all these years I paid for college, and now I figured it out." <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, Dad, that's 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 what I do." <laughs> so. Um, that's cool. So, so Derek, the next question is really for you guys uh, on the uh, on the mobile side. So, couple of, couple of, of related questions here, really kind of digging into that imagery kind of question. You know, what what um, you know, what kind of imagery were you guys were the were the users really interested in, and um, and have you guys uh, actually been uh, enabled them to do offline imagery yet, or or they have to be connected at this point to see the see the images when they're in Explorer. Um, to take the last question for us, yes, we, we have got the offline imagery working, um, cool. both from the phone and the, the PC, and it's a big hit. Um, so that's working very well. I think a big, um, a big part of the imagery and a lot of the work we did was trying to get the imagery manageable, getting it into chunks. Um, and Danielle can probably even talk better to that because those guys did all the work on it. <laughs> um, so if you want to chime in. Yeah. Sure. So what we did was um, we just we took the imagery and we, we put it into TVKs that were um, small enough to be able to be on a device, but large enough to be able to cover the user's like general area of responsibility. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we manage it. And it I mean, it's, it, it works out pretty well. And I think just updating it was a big hit, of course, because the imagery that was there previously was so old. But then the next thing was really being able to break it down so that it was relevant imagery for, for whomever in their location. Yeah, I, I've seen that in the past too. It's you know inevitably the pipeline crosses the corner of every image, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it never goes right. to the middle of one. It's you know instead yes. of it need five images to make one piece of the pipeline, right? So, but, but um, we figured out you know a person would need so many different TPKs, right? In that because of that, that's exactly right. Yep. The pipeline crosses states and boundaries and counties and so forth. Yeah, the other thing to remember about those imagery layers as well, uh, for folks that are considering offline imagery, is that there's different levels in that stack, right? So, you know, you might not need to go all the way down to to the lowest level for the field guys, you know. And I know a lot of companies have have decided, hey, let's do a thousand feet each side of the pipeline, and let's go down to the level where they can see building footprints, right? Because that's kind of like you don't need to go any further down than that offline. If they want to see more detail, then they, then they can go back online. So there's sort of some different interesting ways to, to tackle that offline, online sort of imagery problem. So, Edward, you're back. Can I hear you? Yep. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Cool. I can hear you. So uh, I'll throw one over the fence to you. Uh, so the question is really about the... Um, the 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 creation of the photos like how do we get them off your off your airplane and into our system right so um, you know kind of maybe the, I guess the question is really around is there a lot of post processing that needs to be happening or is this a pretty seamless uh, seamless way to get those images out out into the platform yeah, it's 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 a pretty seamless process it really uh, depends on location geography etc. The, the, the best option is, it, first of all, if there's an encroachment, we get that image right down to the field crews in real time uh, from the aircraft, just like we do on any kind of visual patrol. But the full uh, imagery of the entire line, uh, we have clients that have fiber in the cape, uh, fiber in the hangars, and as soon as we land, it starts the upload process, and then it goes right into however you're storing it, either in Azure or AWS, and then... Uh, the catalog can be built uh, with the Esri system. We have other clients that do FedEx it 
to a uh, to location that they want, and then they ingest it there, so they're getting it the next day. It really depends, uh, you know, how you wanna how you wanna set that up. But I do think uh, with technology and, and different options out there, the ability to even transmit a lot of this from the air uh, or or upon landing over cellular or in other ways, we can prioritize what what gets transmitted and how fast. But certainly upon landing, the full catalog can be uploaded right away. Yeah. And so the process on the Esri end, once those images are taken, there's just simply a geoprocessing tool in ArcGIS Pro. You point it to the set of images and it will read all the metadata directly from those images and create that oriented imaging catalog that goes into your, either ArcGIS Align or, or the portal. And it act, that can actually point to the images that are sitting up in that EC2 instance up in the cloud. So you don't even have to download all the images. You can you can point to them in a cloud storage and then then have that process go and then make those make those images available to the organization. So it's it's a pretty seamless process once you figure out the math and all the parameters. That's what Edward and I have been working on for last couple of months to figure out how this plane is tilting and twisting as it flies down the right away and uh, and get that all that stuff uh, all that stuff lined up so uh, there was a couple of questions uh, on my section and I'll, I'll sort of rattle off a couple of these um, and one of the questions is actually really interesting it says you know because as I showed the demo of the utility network and APR is it, it the question was is it a requirement now to implement both together um, and the, the answer is no actually you can either implement uh, linear reference on its own, or you can implement it in combination with the, with the connected network. So I didn't want to give the impression that, that that's uh, that's the only way to do it the way I was showing, but I certainly feel the combination of the two brings more value than either of them on their own. You know, linear referencing has its own sort of, of way to manage data along long linear transmission segments that's still very very much needed to do all the things we need to do around uh, integrity and, and large data manipulation. And the utility network brings in that, the stuff we've been missing for years about how, how things are connected together. Um, and the other one that that we had was around sort of alignment sheets and asking directly, you know, is our is Esri going to offer up an alignment sheet generator or a, a strip map generator out of ArcGIS Pro? And, and this is really a kind of an important part for us as well, um, you know, we we very much value our partner community, and and when we embarked on this journey, we wanted to do two things: we wanted to have a template database that you could freely download and start using, and tools to edit the data in that database, and that's it, right? We're not going to build an alignment sheet generator or a risk tool or an HCA calculator; those all come from the from the pipeline partner community. And that community is very strong. And, and really that's where those subject matter experts, you know, live, right? An HCA calculator or a class calculator is, uh, is built on Esri technology, but it's the know-how of how to read the regulations and make those tools function as they should to be in compliance is, is really the magic in the soup that the, that the pipeline partners bring to the table. So that's where I want to just kind of, kind of clean up that. So, um, yeah, that's that pretty much gives one question to everybody. We've got some other ones out there, but I know we're about 10 minutes over, so we've got a good solid 20 minutes of Q&A in there. And I, I really appreciate all you guys, your hard effort. I know doing these doing these uh, things not live and, and having to, to do all the hard work up front is a little different than just throwing the presentation on your laptop and, and jotting down to Houston. But uh, I really appreciate all you guys' great stories. I think they all sort of came together in a, in a nice way to, to really kind of summarize how we're bringing value to the pipeline industry using the, the ArcGIS platform. And uh, and I hope to see all you guys in person next year in Houston. I think that uh, everybody's looking forward to that. And, uh, and I, and I I appreciate all your hard work. So with that, I'll say thank you to you guys and uh, we'll catch you on the other side. Thanks everybody.